Maybe says so that she just like pointed him when he's supposed to play something. Right on the other side of Allen Creek, across from 
sit down and you can go to that link. I think it's the same. I'm sure you can do the same spot. Yeah, you can yeah, find yeah. volunteers. It's next Saturday, by the way, and I don't know the time. Is it 12 noon? Well, the, the, uh, it's, it starts at 10, I believe, but the work starts at like 7 a.m. and it goes to like 5. But there's like shorter shifts and then there's longer shifts. There's all kinds of shifts available in there if you want to volunteer for that. So, just wanted to bring that up. Alright, anything else for this morning? We do have one. Oh, yes! We do! I'm sorry. We have a special guest with us today. Um, some of you might know Melanie Dancy, don't you? Melanie Dancy is one of my dearest friends. She's one of my dearest friends here. Um, great, great vocalist and a wonderful woman who is also our practice coach. She works for 22nd Street. Did you do part of the program? What did she say? Program <laughs> and marketing coordinator for 22nd Street. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
alive 
so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth, and the hosts of heaven. We praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy.
bring to ruin the poor of the land, saying, When will the new moon be over, so that we may sell grain in the Sabbath, so that we may offer wheat for sale? We will make the epith smaller and the sheep yoke heavier, and practice deceit with false balances. Buying the poor for silver and the need for a pair of sandals, and selling the weavings of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds.
him, what is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, what will I do? Now that my master is taking the position away from me, I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? He answered, a hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, make it 50. Then he asked another, how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and make it 80. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by dishonest, by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in very little is faithful also in much, and whoever is dishonest in very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will trust you with the riches, the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The Gospel of our Lord.
down for the good guy. Just now. And our second character is a corrupt manager. And when the manager gets extra sketchy and has one last deceitful act to cover his own backside, the rich man applauds. I, I just do get how like much of a struggle this has been this <laughs> week. If I'm looking for who God is like and who people are like in this story, the whole thing makes me very uncomfortable. I read commentaries this week because somebody's got to make sense of this. And one, one writer suggests that the manager had been increasing people's debts for his own profit, right? Like, like we accuse the tax collectors of. And so this is him making it right. That sounds good, doesn't it? That sounds good. I want to I embrace that. The problem is, that's us filling in a whole lot of blanks that aren't in the gospel. last 
new lines and not be distracted by the weirdness of the whole story, but these last words of Jesus. He says, the master praised the manager because children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the children of light. The phrase here is the children of this age and their own generation. It's supposed to make us realize that there's an us and them situation happening here. Children of this age dealing with their generation. And then there's the children of light. It's their world that praises this kind of behavior. This isn't a parable where we look for who represents God and who represents us. This is a warning story. If you live like the world lives, the world can praise you. Go for it. The manager has functioned exactly as the world has set him up to function. He uses his position, he uses someone else's money to gain favor and to secure a place for himself and make sure he's taken care of. He knows that in this society, the people he helped will now owe him one. It's clever. And so the world, the boss, praises him. It's a little bit like a Robin Hood story. He takes from the rich man, at least what he's owed, and he gives to the poorer man, at least relieving what they owe. But it's all to secure his own position. Clever, but in a worldly way. And then Jesus makes that distinction. We are children of light. We should be just as clever, but in a kingdom way. What if the wealth we use, we use in ways that no one can repay? What if we assume that no one can own me one? And what if we give gener with generosity anyway? What if we help people out of debt just because they're in debt? What if we took to heart the Old Testament passages about jubilee, about forgiving debt after a certain point, or not charging interest at all? We're supposed to be looking for the kingdom perspective. And so we have the first reading to support us. Did you catch that first reading? It talked about dishonest wealth. It's almost like they're supposed to go together. But the first and last verses read like this. Hear this, you who trample the needy and bring, the, bring ruin to the poor of the land. The Lord has sworn by the bride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of those deeds. Taking advantage of the needy, keeping the poor poor. They're deeds that the Lord will never forget. Now, here at First English, we could pat ourselves on the back, right? Like most of us know that we should help them, those in need. We're pretty good at that. We do our best with food and clothing, and we've provided legal services, and we, we even provided sanctuary for Miriam. We know we can't help any, everyone. We know that there are a bunch of restrictions, but we do our best. And so what does this mean? We just get to say, like, yay, we're children of light, and we get to move on? Scripture rarely lets us do that. So I think we take this, and we remember that us doing good here doesn't mean that we are done. Remember in the Gospel, towards the end, Jesus said, whatever is faithful in very little will be faithful in much. So let's be faithful in these little things we've been given, and also in the greater things. That's the challenge. We should remember this when we vote. When the issues on our ballots aren't for our benefit, but are for the benefit of those in need. Or when we decide how we feel about taxes. Homeowners. We don't always worry about taxes. Who's benefiting from our tax money, and who is paying the most in tax money? When we look at our nation's system of bail bonds situation, who gets richer? Who gets released? And who gets punished the most severely? And we take all of this and we remind ourselves of it when we hear politicians praying on the poor and the vulnerable. Right now, at this moment, 
undocumented immigrants are being used as pawns in a very nasty political volleyball match. Lots of people using the word fair. What's fair? Is our sense of fair coming from this world or from God's kingdom? Is how they came into this country fair? Is it fair that some of them had to travel through ten other countries to get here? Is it fair that we're lying to them and putting them on planes to manipulate the system for political points? Is it fair that we call them illegal? And is it fair that depending on where you immigrate from, we treat you differently? Because my grandparents immigrated to here from Italy, some of them. Just about 120 years ago. Was it legal? <sighs> Were their names changed when they got to Ellis Island? Some of them, yeah. Were they given papers or did they just kind of move on? But they weren't treated as illegals. So the challenge is faithful in little things and faithful in the greater things. We can take this sense of God's kingdom justice and we look for ways to help individuals in the little things. And then we need to look for ways to use our voice individually and collectively to advocate for larger scale justice. Because, church, we cannot serve two masters. Because the Lord will not forget the deeds of those who trample on the needy and bring ruin to the poor. Amen? Amen.